So, good morning, everybody. Uh, we are going to start with the first keynote of this morning. Just before I start, uh, let me tell you that for Julio to hear your questions, uh, the only way to do it is through a microphone, so I will have to handle with this micro, and then uh, you will have the questions, okay? So it's a pleasure for me to introduce the keynote speaker of today, Dr. Julio Saez Rodriguez. He did his uh, PhD in chemical engineering, then the postdoc in MIT and Harvard, and became PI in the MBA in Cambridge. Then uh, he moved to Aachen, where he was a professor of computational medicine, and he works now in Heidelberg, also as professor of medicine bioinformatics. He's an expert on the study of functional networks and signal networks and the role in uh, these modifications uh, affecting on diseases. So thank you very much, Julio. The floor is yours. I close now the micro. Thanks for the very kind introduction. And it's a pity I cannot be in person with you guys in Barcelona. So, but yeah, I'll try nevertheless uh, to, to share with you some of our work in, in the next hour or so. And uh, yeah, so we are in Heidelberg and uh, in, the, in the medical faculty. And uh, as you disclosed, uh, the family from BSK and Sanofi and Sanofi from Robert and Aztec, two small startups. And uh, with that out of the way, uh, let me first uh, start uh, at a bit of a higher level uh, of um, what is our broad interest and then trying to go a bit deeper also towards how, uh, at least in our group, we try to combine both. Uh, a more data analysis, bioinformatics, machine learning and strategy with a, a, a complementary dynamic mechanistic modeling. And I hope these strategies and, and methodologies can be interesting for you. And of course, later we can discuss in more detail. So generally speaking, uh, we try in our group to see how we can use uh, different large-scale omics data uh, to, to better understand and better predict which therapies are going to be working for a particular patient. So as, as we know, we can generate uh, with increasing uh, accuracy and scope and lower price, different omics like transport omics, proteomics, and so forth. So these are measurements of um, these different molecules across many, if not all, genes. And then for different samples, the samples can be uh, actual patients or can be uh, different um, model systems for the labs and so on. No? And, and also something, and I will come to this later, is it's becoming now also um, feasible to measure this not only for a particular sample, but in the sample uh, to measure all these technologies or these omics for each individual cell and in this in tissues to do this with spatial resolution. And as I said, what we try to do is to try to use this data and also a bit even the measurements microbiome, so not only on the patient, but also the different microbiota that are present sometimes uh, in different tissues to understand and predict which therapies will work better for a different patient. So if you think about how to go about this question, uh, a very natural way is to say, okay, let's take all these large data and feed them into our statistical or machine learning method, and then try to extract relationships between the molecular features and, for example, uh, the prognosis of a disease, so it's a particular molecule, a biomarker of uh, disease, or build a predictive machine learning model that will tell us if, let's say, a drug is going to be effective in a particular patient or not. And as a model system to study this, we and other groups use large collection of cell lines. So this is around 1,000 cell lines. That is a large collection of the Sanger Institute, led by Matthew Carmen, who is an equivalent one at the Broad Institute. And so all these cell lines, they come from different pieces of origin. So they represent uh, different tumor types or, or individuals uh, uh, that uh, have different tumor types. And then we have uh, different of these omics data, like transcriptomics, genomics, and so on. And this uh, keep being added, so now it was released, for example, the proteome of the cell. Line. So you have a lot of these molecular features. And then all the cell lines have been treated with drugs. It's around 400 different drugs, but also now more and more in drug combinations. And then what you, what then you have is uh, for each cell line, 
you see with each of these drugs, and you have like a, a drug response scores. So increasing amount of drugs, you see how many of these cancer cells survive, and this is typically summarized by the CT scan, how much drug you have of cells. And then, um, as I said before, so you could just try to use machine learning, input your data into the algorithm, and try to, to predict the efficacy of drugs. And we and many others have to look at this and try many different algorithms from very simple linear models to more advanced uh, Bayesian technologies. And when, when you do this, and I will just not get into the details and trying to uh, uh, describe this to, to make the point that in general, and in this particular case, uh, using machine learning with its very advanced methods and even in this relatively well-defined context of cell lines from the laboratory. Uh, the algorithms work to some degree, but in, in many cases, the uh, predictability is very low, so they don't really are able to tell us whether a drug is going to work or not. And uh, even more, the interpretability is limited. So, so out of these algorithms, it's known that they're often like black boxes. So even if we, if, if we can predict well whether a drug works or not, it's very hard to understand why, what is the molecular mechanisms behind this. And for this reason, in our group, we have a focus on how we can help machine learning using biological knowledge. And I will show you in a moment what I mean by biological knowledge, but this is different molecular data, pathways, and so on. And the idea is that rather than feeding into your uh, algorithm all your omics data, you use the prior knowledge to extract signatures, features such as the activity of a pathway. And then by using this instead of the raw data, you have a twofold benefit. First, you don't need to look at all genes. Instead, you look at maybe two dozens of features. And having less input features, uh, less emotionality, it gives the power of the statistical methods. And then because these features are rooted on uh, cellular processes such as pathways and so forth, they are mechanistically interpretable. And uh, all the tools and resources I uh, will tell you today are uh, freely available in, in our website. So if anything of this is interesting, you're very welcome to try and to reach out to us and have any questions. The first uh, aspect one needs if you want to use prior knowledge is to, to, to have access to it. And to facilitate this process, we develop a resource called Omnipath, uh, which is simply a one-stop shop which gives you access to many different resources. So over the years, we, we built different types of knowledge, we starting from pathways and networks, uh, adding information about complexes, annotations of this localization of proteins. And more recently, in the context of single data, and I will come to this later, we have also included information about cell cell The total is over 2 million annotations for over 20,000 proteins. And all of this is available uh, either through bioconductor R package, in Python module, or, or Cetuscape plugin. And so the, the basic idea then behind Omnipath is that you have access to many different resources and you can take the one that is more suitable for your analysis in the same way that if, if you wear glasses, you try different lens until you find the right to, to see the best. And with Omnipath, you look at different resources and you pick the right one of combinations of set it out to better analyze the data. So once we have this prior knowledge, as I said before, we, we try to extract uh, mechanistic features. And uh, in our hands, uh, uh, a very valuable strategy to, to extract features is to think of omics data as the downstream or the footprint of a process of interest. And I will elaborate this with some cases, but the general idea is that I'm interested to know uh, what's the activity of, of something like a pathway. And these are often hard to measure directly at this high throughput. So instead, we take the omics data that is easier to measure. And if we know how the process of interest affects the omics data, we can estimate the former from the latter by using causal links that are coming from the biology. To be a bit more specific, uh, uh, let's say you have transcriptomics data, so you can use this to estimate the activity of a path. And the idea here is that if I want to know if this pathway here that is shown in magenta is active, uh, instead of looking at the expression of the genes in the pathway, I would look at the expression of the targeting, so here at the bottom. 
Uh, because the fact that there is more expression of the genes on the pathway doesn't mean that there is more proteins. So these blue nodes here, the continuities of the pathways of proteins are not transcripts. So more transcript doesn't mean more protein, and more protein also doesn't mean more activity. So this depends also on, for example, if the protein is phosphorylated or if it's in the right place, which is in this case in the nucleus. Then this is what we use to estimate pathway activity. We can use the same to estimate the activity of transcription factors. And again, the idea is that it's not looking at the expression of the transcription factor itself. We look at the expression of the target genes as you must And then what uh, we can do is if we have uh, um, estimated, uh, in this case, transcription factors and absolute pathways, we can try to identify key pathways that uh, pass that connects them in, in a large signal network, as is shown here in more. So in a bit more of detail, this is a, a tool called Carnival that we take from Omnipath, a large uh, network here, it's a small one, but it's a network of hundreds or so of different nodes. If we have transcriptomics, we use it to estimate the factors and the upstream pathways. And then an algorithm tries to find the causal paths that explain how changes in upstream pathways define the activity of downstream transcription. And going back now to the cell lines that I, I showed you in the beginning, now we can try to go back to the data and try to get a bit more of a mechanistic insight of what's happening. And then what we do is, because from all of this around, as I said, that goes online, we have the transcripts, but we also have the DNA. We can use the transcripts to estimate the transcription factor and pathways. And actually, the DNA, we can map them on the network to include the effect of different mutations. And then we can build for it uh, uh, of our thousand cell lines uh, a different um, network of causal paths. And then we can try to relate these causal paths to, to the drug response data. So we can try to see if there are specific components whose activity would have inferred from this network and uh, try to see if those are correlated with drug efficacy. And this way, try to find biomarkers or or uh, predictors of drug response that are coming from the network analysis, not uh, simply sort of from the actual level of the evidence. And uh, I, will, I will not go into the results into detail, but what we see is that in fact, these network approaches can find you new biomarkers, new predictors that you will not see when you can only operate on it. Something now I talk about transcriptomics, but the same ideas can be expanded to other type of omics. Uh, so if you have phosphoproteomic data, this uh, is phosphorylation of proteins, and this is mediated by kinase. So the same idea as before applies. I can estimate the activity of kinase by looking at the changes in the downstream phosphorylations here in green. Or if I have metabolomics here on light blue on the right, uh, I can use it to estimate the activity of metabolomics. And in all cases, it's the same concept that I look at changes in the footprint in the omic data to find the activity of the upstream effects. Uh, and then what I can do is, in this multi ion context, I can apply again this idea of finding the causal path in the network that I showed you before with this two carnival. So now applied to multi omics this is a method called Cosmos that we recently developed. And um, I will tell you a bit more about this, and I will do so in the context of specific application. So it's a study where we look at uh, kidney cancer, so uh, colleagues. Rafael Kraman, Christian Suez, and Jesper Olsen. Uh, we had uh, samples of, of kidney cancer and the matching of the tissue. So using mass spectrometry and early sick, we obtained transcriptomic phosphoproteomic and metabolomic data. First, we apply what I just described. So from the transcriptomic estimation factor activities from the phosphoproteomic kinases and from the metabolomic metabolomic science, and here on the, on the right. And then using this uh, carnival algorithms, we try to identify the key pathways that connect. So when you apply this to, to the real data, uh, starting point, this is, as I said, this is very large networks that combine signaling, but also metabolism and um, molecule protein interactions. So it's, it's a huge curve, as you can see here, from 170,000 interactions. And, there is not very much you can do with this very complex network. But now, if you go and you map the activity of this transcription factor, kinesis, and metabolic science, as described in the previous slide, 
And then you find in this large network which pathways are connecting them. So how can we explain that, for example, in cancer, a particular kinase goes up and then a particular transcription factor is going down. So the resulting model, uh, some here on the right, is still quite complex, but much more manageable than, than the last network. So it has around 400 uh, interactions, as you can see. And then you can really zoom in into these uh, components and uh, identify specific uh, pathways or processes that are deregulated in the context of kidney cancer. And, and these are uh, bridging from signaling to gene regulation to metabolism. Here we highlighted in the five mechanisms that either for some of them there was uh, supporting literature that they were indeed important. Some others are hypotheses for, for new analysis. And, and then uh, any of these components in principle, um, if it's a, a kidney regulated process in kidney cancer in this case, are uh, potential candidates for, for therapy. But at this point, I like to emphasize that uh, all these methods really uh, they only give you hypotheses. So it's not like uh, ground truth is not for certain that uh, what the method predicts is, is real. So this, all these uh, are hypotheses that needs to be further validated in uh, orthogonal um, strategies, perhaps with you know, dedicated experiments. So I, I'll summarize then what I have shown you so far. Uh, so this idea that you have omics data, you can first extract the uh, features, the signatures, and in our case, using this idea of, of the footprint to look at the changes in uh, omics data as a way to estimate the activity of the ASCII process. And one thing that is important to note is that uh, this uh, strategy is, is uh, robust to, to missing data, meaning that because the footprint of, for example, a pathway maybe has a hundred different genes, even if you don't measure all those genes, the, the method still works because you have enough to, to get signal. Uh, I will come back to single cell later. Later, but the same, for example, is for phosphoproteomic, but it's also not complete. And then this footprint or footprint derived features, we can map them on large uh, networks and use that to extract uh, key mechanisms that, as I said before, are hypotheses for, for further validation. Uh, so I said this before, uh, I want to emphasize this again that the, the methods uh, that uh, I just saw you work for, for BAP, but also work for single cell. And this study here, I will not go into details to give a number of benchmarks to show that you can apply this to single cell. And uh, so then what this, this means then is that if you have uh, single cell data that is very uh, popular these days, uh, you can use this resource Omnipath and the tools I saw you, but also other tools to try to estimate from single cell uh, data, with the pathways, transcription factors, and so forth. And because Omnipath has access to many different resources, we can also study uh, cell cell communication and just uh, connect to external tools such as Nishnet, which is very common using single cell data. But let me tell you a few more things about this cell cell communication, uh, because this is something. Uh, quite broadly used for single cell data. So uh, in case you, you haven't looked at uh, single cell data, what uh, uh, many people do is to say, OK, if I have a single cell RNA, I, I, I use it to cluster groups of cells. And then uh, I want to know if these groups of cells that can be, for example, different cell types, like macrophages and fibroblasts, for example, you want to know if they are communicating if they're exchanging information. And then what you would say is, OK, if uh, a group of cells have a high level of expression of a particular ligand, that then would be here is yellow triangle, and the other cell type B has a high level of, of the corresponding receptor, it is likely that these two cells are, are communicating. Right? But of course, uh, similarly to what I said when I described the pathway activity, the fact that there is more RNA doesn't mean that there is more protein, so it doesn't mean really that there is communication. So these methods are all indirect. And there is many methods, uh, which all follow the same principle, but they have uh, different settings. 
So it's a way to kind of allow us to combine, compare, and understand all these different methods. Building on, on Omnipath, where we have access to all those different uh, databases, we built a, a tool called Liana, which allows its analysis frameworks for this Liana receptor interactive and combines many resources, many of the different methods. And, uh, and then, as I said before, by inputting a single cell RNA in different clusters, you can estimate cell cell community. And uh, in, in a paper that uh, is coming out soon, uh, and I guess. And if you want to know more, let me know. We benchmark uh, many of these methods and resources. And, and the, the summary is that we found that most of them are able to capture some signal about social communication, but it's, it's far from perfect. And, and this makes sense if you think about this biologically. So as I said before, what these methods do is to combine the expression of the ligand in a particular cell type with the expression of the receptor in, in, in the the under cell type, but in truth, communication is mediated by um, proteins or other molecules that are not uh, RNAs. So, in these methods, you're assuming that from the expression level, uh, you, you can estimate the whole process, but of course, after the RNA expression translation has to happen into the protein, then this protein has to be secreted from the cell into the medium, it has to be used. Has to reach the target cell and then trigger a response. And um, there is a lot of steps that are not really uh, captured by single cell RNA data, but uh, nevertheless are, are certainly happening. So uh, that's why, um, uh, as I mentioned before, we, we need a number of benchmarks to try to understand how well these uh, technologies that we don't really um, capture all these intermediate steps. How much they can approximate. And, and it's very hard to benchmark this. There is some really good ground truth. But we use uh, indirect measurements, uh, such as spatial transcriptomics. Uh, and in general, as I said before, we find that many of these methods get signals. So, so they capture uh, likely uh, signaling events, but not, not of them are right. So, similarly to what I said before when I was talking about this network analysis. All these bioinformatics methods, they only give you a hypothesis, but then you should further uh, investigate and, and validate with uh, independent methodologies. And so the, the last uh, frontier or dimension that is, is very important in, in, in this context of omics data is, is spatially resolved data. So uh, Single cell data is very exciting. You can look at individual cells, their molecular profiling, but so doing so, you have to dissociate them. And if these cells come from a particular tissue, so you don't know where these individual cells were in. But some technologies, and, and this field is developing as we speak very rapidly, uh, allow us to, to not only measure the status of individual cells, but also to know their spatial location on the original tissue. So this allows us to even understand better the structure of tissues and how cells can interact. So as an application where, where we look at this, uh, we work with some colleagues studying uh, myocardial infarction, which um, I guess we all know is uh, a major source of, of, uh, of death in our society. And in particular, a process that happened when infarction takes place, which is called cardiac remodeling. And this means that after the heart suffers its myocardial infarction, there is a remodeling, which is a change in the, in the, in the structure and the functionality of, of the heart, which involves processes of inflammation and fibrosis, but it's not really well understood at the molecular level. And then to shed some light on this, uh, we work with colleagues in Aachen, Rafael Kaman Costa, and Milton Weinhausen. Here in Germany to characterize uh, samples from patients that have suffered infection. And uh, so we have um, multiple samples for each patient. And in some cases, we have measurements in the ischemic zone, so where the infarct took place, the remote zone, which is the healthy tissue far away from the infarct, and intermediate border zones, and we also have uh, fibrotic tissue. And then we combine single cell technologies like single cell RNA seq, also a technology called attack seq, which tells us about chromatin accessibility. So, how open is the DNA and the prescription factors combined to it. 
And one of these spatial technologies for lithium, where we can measure many spots in the tissue, and this allows us then to, to get this special results information. Although this technology in particular uh, has the limitation that uh, you don't have the single cell resolution. So each of these spots, when you measure RNAs, is, um, uh, contains a few cells, uh, typically five different cells. So then you need to try to understand each spot, each cell cell resolution. So then our idea was how we can combine this uh, single cell technologies and spatial technologies by using computational methods, computational modeling to better understand the interaction between or uh, better regulation of, of both the intracellular and intercellular processes in the context of myocardial infarction compared to healthy tissue, but also to the chronic uh, uh, disease heart. So, so the first thing that we did is to use a technology called cell to location to, to combine the single cell RNA and the spatial data to estimate in each of the spots of the spatial result data which cell types are present. Because I told you before, we, the technology doesn't give you what's happening in each individual spot with individual cell, but using the single cell data, we can estimate the presence of different cell types in the spot. And when you do this, uh, you get uh, these results. So here is in a new map, in, in a two dimensional plot, uh, summarize the profiles of the different samples and they are color coded according to whether they are uh, ischemic, so coming from the started heart, from a fibrotic heart, getting blue or myogenic, more or less the healthy samples. And what you see as, as you expect is in the healthy tissue, you have mostly cardiomyocytes and breads major cell type in a healthy cell. As the cell becomes erotic, uh, you get fibroblasts, so uh, the major drivers of fibrosis and, and the ischemic heart, the heart is after infection. Uh, you also see a lot of um, uh, myeloid cells, different immune cells. And it's also known that in the case of infection, there is a very important immune response. But we want to go beyond uh, looking at cell types, and here's where we again we leverage this idea of prior knowledge and, and the tools I told you before to try to extract uh, mechanistic insights. Uh, and uh, so what, what we did is to apply on each of the spots in the tissue these methods to estimate activity of pathways. For example, here is a patient who, who has um, chronic. Um, infection and, and then we see that TGF beta, which is partly involved in cirrhosis, is very active in certain zones of the tissue. Then we can look at the downstream uh, transcription factor activities and also at the at the expression level of regulated tissues. And if you're interested in regulation here, we could use this attack data, so this information on on the how open is the DNA, the chromatin to better estimate the activity transcription factor. But then uh, what we wanted to do next is, is to go beyond uh, looking at what's happening in the spot, but trying to better understand the interaction between the spots. So can we, given that we have special results data, can we use this to, to better um, understand uh, how particular cell types influence different cell types? And for this, we developed um, a multi-level machine learning model from this team which allows you to do that. So it allows you to extract from a particular um, uh, special resource data set, how much of the changes in a particular spot depends on this spot, how much depends on the direct neighbors. So let's call it the local view, how much depends on more distant neighbors and so forth. And this framework is flexible, so you can apply it to other type of questions or other type of so-called views. So the effect of, of uh, different types of, of uh, structural features. And, and so when we apply this to this uh, hard data, uh, what we found is that the presence of uh, a particular subtype of fibroblast, so the not clear with fibroblast 2, is highly dependent of the presence of a, of a macrophage, which is SPP1+, plus. it's a particular macrophage that's it's known to be involved in autophagy. So, uh, and, and this was something that was estimated from, from, the, from the analysis with this machine learning method with this thing. And uh, here is, is the underlying data supporting this on uh, spatial transcriptomics. 
And then this was validated with another technology that does give us the, the single super solution. And what we could really see that there is this color calibration of this myofibrillar uh, and microcytes. And again, um, uh, this opened the way to more mechanistic studies that we are looking at now, trying to better understand how these macrophages and these fibrolas communicate. And as I mentioned, it's not to involve, um, or it's not to involve autophagy and other molecular processes that we are not looking at. Sorry. Okay, so uh, uh, actually at this point, uh, uh, I'd like to maybe uh, check quickly if, if there are any questions so far, also because since I cannot, I cannot see you so well, uh, I wanted to see if you could follow, because now in the second part, we will change a bit gears in the type of approaches. Is there any question on, on this part or any comments? Online, offline. That. Maria, please. So Maria commented in the chat that she has a question. You? Oh, hello. Hi, Maria. Can Hi. you listen to me? Ah, okay, yeah. I, I didn't know that I can speak. So thank you for the the explanation. It was very inspiring for me. I wish I could listen it a couple of years ago. <laughs> but uh, I have a question regarding Omnipath. Mm, do you know if you can like select the cell type that you want to build the, the network? And because you know that sometimes having experimental information or data is very not common, at least for us. So mm -hmm. Then it's difficult to adapt this omnipath, I think, for a cell type if there is not a like a something that you can select this cell line or even for a disease, I think. Yeah. Is there is there is this option in omnipath? So this is a, a very good question. So as, so as Maria points out, normally we would like to have the information which is cell type specific. But most of the resources of pathways or networks, they are not cell type specific. And, and uh, so one way to try to make them specific is to use omics data, for example, proteomic or transcriptomic to refine or to prune a general network to make it cell type specific. For example, you can take data from the human protein atlas or vitex and then uh, make a, a network specific. And, and this is something you can do from Omnipath. Um, I mean, it's not like the core of Omnipath, but it's in uh, different uh, scripts or functions you can do this. And maybe if you want later, uh, if you send me an email, you can use this on pointers. But this is a very good point. No? In general, the knowledge is not specific. And, and then we need to find ways to make it more specific. And, with all the large omics public data sets, I think it's something that we can at least try to approximate. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Maria. So there are no more questions. Uh, I will continue on, as you can see, it's different type of approaches now. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, let's, let's see how it goes. So this is, was my, my first slide where I was telling you that uh, we try to use biological knowledge to to help the more sophisticated machine learning model um, to extract features from omics data. And I hinted in some cases, and we have different contexts of evidence that uh, this mechanistic knowledge really helps uh, machine learning uh, strategies, but still is far from perfect. There is large room for improvement. We have also looked at this not only in our own research, but we've been involved in, in crowdsourcing efforts so-called green challenge, where what you try is to, to ask the community to develop new methods. So instead of trying to find the best strategy, for example, to predict drug response, you could put data set out there and ask people to, to make their own predictions, and then you see how well they do. 
And what you do is then you learn about many strategies. So this was very helpful. Uh, but then also we found that in general, teams that use biological knowledge, like networks, practice, and so forth, did better than those that did not. But also there is a lot of um, you know room for improvement. And, uh, and that is why we think it's important to complement this very large omics profiling with machine learning with more focus uh, dedicated uh, dynamic mechanistic model. Uh, and these two things, we shouldn't see them as uh, adversarial or, or decoupled uh, because the more focused work in mechanistic modeling can be informed by the analysis on the more unbiased large machine learning data. Uh, and it also relies, as you will see, prior knowledge and data. But the key difference is to build these dynamic models. Dynamics means they describe how things respond to, to perturbations. So you need data where it will be perturb cells and follow things like that. And so to, to build this uh, dynamic models in our group, we focus on using a logic formalism. So it's a very simple description of networks, uh, of models by analogy to an electric circuit, but because they are very simple, they're very scalable, but you can use different mathematical formalisms. So often the logic models are described as Boolean systems or binary systems. But you can use other formalisms, including differential equations to have full, fully continuous uh, dynamic models. And the general idea then is that you combine, again, the biological prior knowledge, for example, from Omnipath, with uh, experimental data, in this case, of, uh, different conditions reflecting different perturbations. And we have a tool, SEMNOT, or variation of components, that builds these logic models out of the data and the biological. Model. And this strategy to build models, you can apply this to many different types of, of data. We focus on signaling. So for signaling, the most informative is proteomic and forceful proteomic because the signaling is mediated by proteins. So we started with using it uh, on antibody-based uh, bulk data. Uh, then we also expand this to mass spec data. Uh, we recently have to the single cell data, which we'll see that in a moment. And uh, you can also use it to study the interface between signaling and metabolism combining proteomics and metabolomics. So this is one example of how this applies if you have mass spec data, if you have mass with also proteomic data, uh, you, you can yeah, build these dynamic models. And, and as you can see, they can get quite complex if you measure a lot of phosphorylation sites, in this case, around 800 phosphocytes. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, the, the, the main idea then is can we use these uh, dynamic models to help in this question of, of prediction of drug response? So can we go back to the large data sets on, on uh, drug response and try to use these dynamic models to, to go a bit deeper into why some drugs work or don't work? So then we did that in, in a couple of contexts. So the idea is, eh, as you remember, we have uh, these large data sets with many cell lines to do with many tracks. So we focus on a particular group of cell lines uh, for which we cannot really predict very well the efficacy of drugs using machine learning. And we do this deep dive with uh, perturbation data and with dynamic modeling. So by perturbation data is you take the cells, you stimulate them, you put drugs, you put ligands, and you measure the phosphorylation of proteins over time. And then uh, you use this uh, logic modeling framework to take a generic network and, and uh, this to the cell type specific data to be cell type specific parts, which, by the way, is one uh, way to do what Maria asked before of how we can take a generic network and make it cell type specific. In this case, we do this uh, by doing these dynamic models. Uh, and then uh, uh, in one application, we look at uh, colon cancer data. In this case, we use a uh, phosphorylation technology called Luminex. We had 14 different colon cancer cell lines from the large uh, screening panel. Um, so we can measure phosphorylation after the perturbation and taking uh, a large uh, signaling network, which is generic, and by fitting it to each of the cell lines, we could get cell-type specific models. 
And then we try to correlate the features of these uh, models to, to the drug response data and try to see if parameters of the model, and again, this model is based on perturbation data, it's a dynamic model. Uh, if features of these models are correlated with the efficacy of drugs. Uh, and so this is just to show you the different models. These are the 14 cell lines, uh, and each of them has a different model. Uh, the, the black lines are the lines that are active, strongly active in a particular cell lines, and the light gray are those that are not. So and as if you look a bit, you will see that some pathways in this network are active in some cell types, cell lines, and some in the others. Uh, and then if you try to correlate, as I said before, the parameters of this model with drug response, we found uh, multiple cases where there was a strong correlation between um, uh, the parameters and the drug efficacy. So here is one example where we found that a parameter that uh, regular or describes the activity or responsiveness of a kinase called DSP3, it is very correlated with the activity of an inhibitor, a MAC inhibitor. So each of these dots is a cell line. And what we see is across the 14 cell lines, the, the more active this is DSP3, the higher is the efficacy of the MAC inhibitor, which means higher efficacy means less efficacy. So then the hypothesis we had is, okay, if this correlation is also reflecting a, a causal mechanism, so basically a relationship between the status of this history and the activity of these MEC inhibitors, which are in different pathways. So now MEC is in the Martinez pathway, this history is in the ATP mTOR pathway. So if there is some crosstalk between them, and this crosstalk is important for uh, or affects the activity of the drug, uh, what we reason is it does causal by by blocking the drug on this tissue by making it uh, uh, less responsive to stimulation, then this would affect the, the efficacy of the inhibitor and therefore the cell line should kind of come to this part of, of the diagram. So we did this for the 14 cell lines. Uh, I will only show you the extremes. As I control, the cell lines here is already very sensitive to, to MEC. If you put uh, inhibitors of ESP3, we have different inhibitors. Uh, as we put more inhibitors, the efficacy of, of MEC inhibitor does not change, as you expect, because it's already very efficacious and it's already top. But if you go to the cell lines in the top right uh, that are not sensitive to MEC, by adding uh, the ESP3, you increase the activity of, 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 of the previous drug together, meaning that um, uh, these drugs together work better than the MEC inhibitor alone. And that's uh, I mean, one example of how you can uh, use a dynamic model to, to find first a, a, a model biomarker that you would not see only from looking at the data. So in this case, this activity of SP3, we found that it's uh, uh, predictive of the efficacy of the MEC inhibitor, but also it allows us to suggest a combination of two inhibitors, one MEC, one DSP3, that are uh, together more effective than the drug alone. We then did a variation of this study uh, using uh, another technology called cytox, my cytometry. So in my cytometry, you measure the phosphorylation of uh, around 30, 40 proteins. Uh, at the single levels, in single cells. So this means then that you can get a lot of uh, cells on individual cells, but then we apply the same strategy. This was done with lab of uh, And in this case, what's not colon cancer, but breast cancer, but it's the same idea. So you build uh, from each breast cell line a data set of, of perturbation of drugs and ligands. Uh, you take a unique network to build one model for each cell line. And then you try to relate the model features to the drug response. And here is to show you the model. So as I said, uh, this data is with single cell resolution. So, so you really have uh, a lot of data points. So in total, you measure over 80 million uh, cells. Uh, and then you have yeah, time courses of how this, all these different uh, uh, cell lines respond to the stimulation with, with drugs and so forth. It takes a nap to build these logic models. In this case, this is the differential equation, so you can really capture a nice dynamics. And then it's just to show 
that uh, the models we build could look at the differences in different cell lines in the response of the dynamics. And then this led to biomarkers based on the model, like in the case before, that uh, you could not find by simply looking at the base of it. And so, so the last thing I wanted to say in this context is can we apply this idea of dynamic modeling and perturbation data to patients? So the last examples I showed you on colon cancer and breast cancer, they were both in the context of cell lines. And this is uh, helpful and interesting, but at the end, of course, we want to know how to treat the tumor in patients. But to make these perturbation experiments, you really need uh, a lot of material. So you need to take cells, treat them with many drugs, measure the activity. So this is not something that you can do uh, with tissues. The question is, how can you apply these strategies really to, to patients? If you are looking at the at, at disease in the blood, that's still doable because you have um, uh, you can get a lot of blood from patients in, in, in many cases. So this is a study led by Marty Bernardo uh, was published last year where we look at multiple sclerosis. So we had blood from around 150 donors. And then again, the same strategy. So from these samples, from the users of the blood, you prefer uh, them with different ligands and drugs. You use this to take a generic network and make one model for each of the donors. And then these this basic uh, models, by studying them, you can look for combination therapies by trying to find um, which drugs together uh, repair the, the circuit of, of the C cell. And so in, in this case, so this is the, the summary. So we have this, this large network covering the major signal pathways of the immune cells. And doing some analysis of the models, we come up with a combination of two therapies. And then this therapy was then validated in the mouse model, where, as you can see, so the combination of these two drugs, of single mode and TAC inhibitor, uh, this means uh, the phenotype of multiple sclerosis in a much stronger way than uh, the individual drugs. So you can do this if you have blood, you can uh, generate data to build dynamic models. But what about if you have tissues, uh, meaning uh, organs that are not liquid, which is much harder to extract um, material in large amounts? So for this, what we did is to work with Christoph Merten, uh, the time in Vienna, in Lausanne, and meet partners in Athens, Austin Graham and Smyman, to use microfluidics to perform drug screenings in very small amounts of material. So the idea is that encapsulate in small droplets, as you did here, a few cells with some drugs and some information to barcodes to know which drugs we could sell. And then uh, you measure the, the efficacy of, of, of the drugs on, on the cells using our Kaspersky reporter. So, how much you figure up, of course, is although now we can also connect this to Adam Sick. But the idea is that by using this um, microfluidics, uh, uh, as shown here, you can really automatize the process of screening drugs in very small amount of material, so you can take biases and do it right there. And this is just to show the, how you can do this in, in four biases from primary tumors and make a lot of pairwise combinations of drugs. So this is eight value drugs in combination and you can see different effects of the drugs. But then what you can do is to also use this data to, to build models. So again, the same story as before. So you have from each patient a drug response data Set, you have a generic network, uh, and then by training the generic network to the data of each patient, you build a model for, for, for each patient. And then by studying these models, uh, you can try to come up with better combination of therapies. So, this is the model uh, that came out of, of this analysis. Some of this explains the regulation of car space or so the apoptosis, which is uh, the result of our experiments. And then, uh, as before, you find uh, the activity of, of, um, of different pathways, changes across different patients. In this case, it's represented by this uh, square sphere. So each of the little squares is, is the level of activity in each of the patients, and it's paralyzed across the patients. But then you can take the models and use them to simulate the effect of stress. And that's another feature of these dynamic models, that it's not only that you can look at them, 
but you can simulate uh, new conditions. Now, what happens is now I put a rack here, I put a rack there. Uh, and so we did that. Uh, and in particular, we try different drug combinations. Uh, we try to see uh, which drugs can be efficacious. And um, we could not go back to the patients, uh, but uh, instead of this, we did the same exercise in cell lines and now cell graphs. And in those cases, uh, the model predictions when taken back to, to the cell lines or to the mice, uh, the combinations predicted by the model were efficacious. So this means that using this perturbation data from this microfluidic technology combined with mathematical modeling, it's an strategy to come up with new drug combinations. And uh, as I said, we couldn't do this in, in patients, uh, but this is not something we are starting to do. So we're going to start a, a trial, uh, trying different combinations on, on, on different patients. And this is just one example. So it's, of course, only, only one patient. So this uh, doesn't prove anything. We need many more patients to, to really see if this stuff is really helpful. But so in this case, um, as an example, so this is a patient. <coughs> that whose treatment uh, failed, so the, the standard uh, of care didn't work, which is a combination of these two drugs. So our colleagues in Athens took uh, a biopsy, this microfluidic experiment was done, and so the microfluidic, this different combination was proposed, of cisplatin and benzitabin. So it's now you go to, to the patient uh, who had this, yeah, this tumor that has as I said, not uh, respond to, to the first therapy, uh, then you, you give this combination, and then the, the tumor largely decreased, uh, which means that the drug is, is being effective. Uh, of course, this, uh, as I said, this doesn't prove anything, or even in the case of this patient, eventually the tumor develops a system mechanism and came back. But this is an illustration of how we think that we can really, in, in the near future, using microfluidics and mathematical modeling, perform drug screenings uh, directly as vivo from patients. And this information complements the more standard uh, uh, information that the pathologists and, and, and the, the, the doctors use to, to pick treatments because it's a bit more functional, it's how it's self response to the drugs. And hopefully this can help to improve how we treat cancer patients in different conditions. So with that, uh, I'd like to finish. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the people who, who did the work in the lab, uh, in particular. So the NES is the main developer of Omnipath. Uh, Rosa did all the carnival work on the cell lines. Ovalian did the multi-om integration cosmos. Martin did the multiple sclerosis study. And Federica, the last ones on the cancer with microfluidics. By the way, we are looking for postdocs and PhD students, in case any of you are interested. And uh, Heidelberg is a uh, nice town, maybe not as nice as Barcelona, but this is not a nice small research town. And uh, I'll just try in the last few minutes to summarize what uh, I tried to tell you today. So um, I think that there's uh, a lot of value in, in combining um, let's say machine learning and data analysis with more dynamic modeling for uh, modeling of patients, of organs, and for systems pharmacology. Uh, first, machine learning, if you apply this to, to omics data, as I'm trying to state, is certainly a powerful strategy, but still is a long way to go. And we think that combining uh, or using biological knowledge helps a lot this type of strategies because you increase not only the performance of machine learning but also the interpretability. In this context, I emphasize the, the value of this idea of the footprint as a way to extract features from all this data. So if you, if you want to know about the process, I look at the downstream things, for example. Then I talk a bit about how these strategies can also be applied to single cell and special use of data which is, is very exciting because uh, it opens new opportunities but also has some challenges for the computation. And the last part, I describe how we can use dynamic models of, of signaling pathways based on perturbation data and how this can many times uh, shed light on things that the pure machine learning couldn't tell us much. And this is mostly uh, because of, we think of, of this idea that how cells respond to perturbation is very important of its functionality. And this 
cannot be captured only by profiling uh, in steady state in the basal state samples, but seeing how the response to perturbations. And, and, and so based on this in general, our, our idea is to have biological knowledge, a genetic model. This model you can then train to placing a specific data, can be this static data, the machine learning strategy as we talked at the beginning, or can be more dynamic data, data for perturbation. But in both cases, you try to build a basing specific model uh, and use it to, to strike mechanistic descent into the disease, but also to better predict the efficacy service. And with that, I'd like to finish also saying again that all our tools are fully available and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Julio. So if there are questions, I will bring the micro. Questions also in the online? Uh, maybe I can break the ice. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Julio, for this, this very, very nice talk. And it's really impressive and inspiring work. Uh, my question is, is really a curiosity. Uh, so in a, in a project that is supporting this, uh, this summer school, we're targeting musculoskeletal uh, tissue regulation with uh, very long inertia of tissue changes over several years. And during this process, uh, there are many modifications because of mechanical loads uh, and, and, and cell senescence there are many modific modifications of the cell sensitivity to its microenvironment. So the interplay, mm -hmm. for example, between uh, inflammatory factors and, and the chronic mechanical loads that the organ is, uh, is seeing, so it becomes modified uh, over the time. And this is, this is what drives, in the end, the phenotype. So I, I understand this is an extremely complex question, but how do you envision this could be tackled uh, through modeling, for example, by, by using the kind of approaches that you've presented? Yeah, it's a good question. So I guess if I understand it, the major challenge would be the mechanical aspects, no? Uh, I mean, the, let's say what I described focus on molecular uh, interactions, communications, but uh, as I understood your in your context, there is mechanical forces to include into the model. Is this right? So to put it a little bit more biological, yeah. let's say that yeah. you have mechanoreceptors on the cells that have a specific response under a specific biochemical environment, so with specific mm -hmm. uh, cytokines. So at uh, time zero, the response is one thing. And uh, at time uh, 10 years, the response becomes another thing. And so there is, a, there is a whole history that is actually important to drive a specific phenotype. And, and this is, for example, in osteoarthritis, okay. yeah. this kind of disease, that's, that's very important to capture that in order to have proper uh, drug treatment strategies, which we don't have right now. I understand. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. So, so. I guess it's, it's a challenging uh, question. Uh, I mean, one way you could start thinking of this could be, as you said, that over time, based on, on the environment, uh, the, how the, the mechanical receptors respond changes. So the, maybe the simplest approximation could be that we have like different snapshots, right? So we could envision that over time, as this uh, effect of the environment uh, comes in, the kind of the wiring of, of the mechanoreceptor network changes. And I mean, this is a bit, you know, I could be analogous to, for example, how the network of, of, of a patient can cancer evolves over time. So that could be one way, very simplistic snapshots. And then next step could be to basically have a, kind of a dynamic model that describes the evolution over time of the network. Now, uh, I mean, we haven't done this ourselves, but that would be how I would think about this. But yeah, it's a very good question. Yeah. 
Hi, thank you. It was very nice seeing Luminex being in the presentation. And so I want to ask, aren't a little bit the networks biased towards how many antibody pairs you have when you build the networks? Wouldn't it be better to have less cell lines and do mass spec data and do and get phosphoproteomic data from mass spec so you can have a bigger network yeah, and you have yeah. better networks? So that's uh, true. So uh, and, and in a way, it's a trade-off. No? So the mass spec, although it's improving a lot, still is it takes more time and cost than the, uh, running the antibody kits. So we, we have done that as well. So we have projects where we have mass spec data. Uh, with also proteomic, and uh, then you have much larger networks and get more unbiased. Uh, but uh, yeah, but then you cannot do at least in the same budget. You cannot do so many conditions. So it's a trade-off between coverage and not missing out things that you don't know about, and um, uh, yeah, exploring the dynamic response. And one could think, you know. I saw you one extreme, you could, we have done the other extreme, you could also think of doing hybrid. You, know? you could say, okay, maybe I do first mass spec with few conditions, just to identify, uh, but well chosen, for example, drugs that I am most interested in. This is, uh, I'm doing network models, uh, and, and, and you can build these models, right? So I think I showed it briefly. So, uh, uh, so you can build such models for, for mass spec. Uh, like this one here, right? So, uh, and then users could pick to see, okay, which of the processes seems to be key, seems to be responding to my lack of interest, and then maybe if I want to do more conditions or more time resolution, then maybe go to the antibody. No, like in this case, I would see, oh, I don't know, Eric is very important, and ATT is very important, PKA, and then uh, I follow up in a more detailed manner with more but, Yeah, but there is always this trade-off, uh, coverage, and throughput, which means uh, throughput means in our case more drugs, more ligands, or more time points, which is another key aspect. You know, the time point at which you measure for dynamics is essential, and I, I didn't discuss this, but uh, you know, if you cut only one or two time points, you have to choose them really well, but they inform you about how the cell responds to stimuli. And that's again a trade off, no? coverage and picking the right dynamics. And then another question, <clears throat> because when you build networks and then you usually you see that hub proteins get the more, when you have a condition, usually it's a hub protein that connects, it's a connector in the network. So can, for example, the networks first highlight proteins that they're not hub proteins and maybe also, so what kind of drugs they're not gonna be bad for the, for the organism? Because okay, you can find the protein, but if it's pretty much like a napalm, in the organism that kills everything, then it's yeah, not like a the exactly. drug. Yeah, you're very right, and uh, in a way, what you look for is uh, differential activity, right? So you should always compare against the effect on a on a healthy cell and and, uh, and try to see something that affects what is very different. So and um, and it's also what you said. So it. If your target is uh, a very active protein, it's very likely to have a lot of side effects, and, and you should uh, take that into account. Uh, also, the, the, the hubs, I mean, this is also a bias that comes into the network. So, when we draw these networks, like here, no, you have ATT linked to many things. In truth, we don't know if this is really because it's always very important molecule or because it has a lot of knowledge about it because it's been studied and we look at this recently and there are clear biases in what the literature focuses on right uh, and, and then, then again this will uh, propagate the models and, and in the models you are more likely then to find the hubs because they are hubs in the network which means they were very studied so it's a bit of a self-fulfilling process uh, and there are ways in the algorithms to try to correct, to kind of say, okay, I, I, I kind of normalize uh, against the hubs, and I, mean, I, I only find the hubs if they are really more important. Um, but yeah, these are very good questions, and we always have to keep in mind on one hand, these biases in our knowledge, and second, as I said, the fact that uh, 
uh, trivial solutions uh, to to stop the growth of a tumor uh, is of course a poison that may also kill the patient. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe a bit related to that, um, so especially when you're working with knowledge-based uh, modeling, so you're not obligatorily controlling very well what you should include, what you, sh what you shouldn't include, and then there is a huge work of uh, network cleaning that is based on um, testing, different tests, uh, whether you, you get an, uh, an expected uh, answer according to a specific perturbation, and uh, within the, the, the the kind of huge networks and systems of networks that you're handling. So do you have a, a standardized way uh, actually to do this cleaning? Do you, do you, are you successful in defining standardized tests and uh, is it necessary actually to, to go for the development of these standardized tests if it doesn't exist? So what, what, what would you mean by a test? Uh, a test means that you perturb the network in a specific way and you're expecting uh, a specific response, so a benchmark, yeah, yeah, yeah. which allows you then to say, okay, uh, this node you know, is, is, is a bit annoying <laughs> and I will get a little bit more into that and effectively it shouldn't be here or it shouldn't be connected that way. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah this is a very important limitation and, uh, or, or question to keep in mind. And I guess a limitation is often to have really ground truth. So how do you know what should come out? This is, I think, general actually many of, of these strategies. And I mentioned this when I was talking about cell-cell communication. But for the networks, I mean, you can indirectly test that the models are working well. If, for example, you leave out some data and you try to see if your model can predict the data, uh, this can be particular condition, like a particular uh, knockdown uh, or condition that you have done, or can be leaving out some of the measurements, in this case, uh, see the model can predict some of the things that are going up in red. Um, and, and that's very important to, to get a sense that the model is working. Uh, or, uh, yeah, as you were saying, so if you have, you can use the model to, to make a, a prediction on, on, on the importance of a particular node and then follow this up experimentally and block it and see if it is as important as the model says. But then, um, yeah. So, in a way, you can use the models to make predictions and see how well the predictions work. But truly, knowing what is the underlying molecular ground truth, I think it's harder, at least at large scale. And uh, that's why, yeah, we have to go a bit indirect. Uh, well, actually, I have done another question. As so, how how is the level of translation of all what you're doing uh, to clinics? So, can you envision that at some points this can become uh, a part of of routine exploration, advanced diagnosis, uh, advanced assessment of uh, fitness of a patient to specific drug or combination of of drugs? How, how are you seeing that? And then what might be the yeah. challenges? So, so the first part, which is ways to extract features from omics data, this we have worked a bit here with people in, in the clinic in Heidelberg that they have uh, trials where they're doing genome and transcriptome profiling. And they run some of our tools and you will see if they really are valid. But I think that's if that's the case, no, that's a relatively easy way to contribute because if the data is there and it's well generated, running some of these methods on top is not that hard. And then, of course, this data or this information has to be combined with others in the tumor bars, let's say. Uh, so the latter part, the dynamic modeling and the perturbation data, that's much harder because uh, as I saw at the end of this microfluid, if you, you really would need to generate dedicated data. And, and we would like to move in that direction and we, we will try, but you need to develop basically a, a device, a system that can uh, be run robustly in, in, in a hospital, right? So, 
So one thing is to do the experiments in, in, in a research laboratory by really experts. And the other thing is, is to be able to, to run such perturbation experiments uh, routinely. And I think this needs technological development. We are optimistic that at least it's worth the far, but this will take a bit longer time. Thanks. And, and, and maybe the last question, Baldo will kick me out from the, from the auditorium. Uh, <laughs> so here there are uh, several people working with uh, population cohorts, uh, specifically twins UK cohorts, so that has uh, homo homozygotes uh, twins, and, um, and the northern Finland bird, uh, birth cohort. So how do you, how do you, because I, I hadn't the impression that you're working actually uh, with, with population courts in order to make the development, or maybe, maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Do you think uh, these courts bring an added value to, to all these, these developments and uh, maybe also the, the testing and application? So you mean cohorts of patients, like uh, the population cohorts like no, not not patients actually. People from the general population that are recruit, recruited and then uh, followed up over um, uh, several years. Ah. We're talking about decades, and they have uh, regularly so uh, blood samples, uh, urine samples. Uh, they also might have uh, different medical imaging explorations. And, and yeah. so you have actually the whole history, so some patients will stay healthy, some others will develop uh, certain conditions, and uh, so these are the population cores I'm talking about. Ah, so yeah, like UK Biobank, for example, no? Uh, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we have looked a bit in that. I mean, I would say we are not really the experts, but I think these are really, really, really great resources because yeah, as you said, it gives you a more natural population that uh, reflects yeah, the spread of the population, and, and as you said, is traced over decades, um, and, and that's very important, I think, to, for many diseases and, and can be used in, for many questions. And I think it's really helpful that it's also the UK Biobank make this data available to any research, right? And, and you can come, you know, studies like ours, but many others and try to see what we can learn. And as I said, in some specific cases, we have, we are looking at this, and also th these resources will keep increasing. Um, more patients, more molecular layers, I think they will become a, a super valuable resource, and com computational groups like ours, you know, can have a lot of fun looking at this data. Thanks. Sure. A question regarding the um, study that you were doing, that you had many patients and that you built an individualized network for every patient. Out of curiosity, were there any, for example, if you saw the network of every patient, could you, for example, say his age, if he's smoking, BMI, comorbidities, just from the network? Could you see if there are underlying hidden patterns just from what is phosphoproteomically there? So I, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, probably we do not have enough amount of patients to get the signal out, because I guess the signal would not be very trivial. I mean, going back to the UK Biobank, I think in that place is where it has, it has a lot of patients, you can really see this more there. But I, I, my, if I had to bet, I would say there is a signal that you could see in the models and in the source of data. But you will need larger cohorts uh, to, to really see this in a significant manner. No? Just take my. More questions? Okay. So maybe we can move to the next. Thank you very much, Julio. Nice thing. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Pablo. Bye.